All right, let's start. Hi, everyone. Welcome to all of our viewers who are joining us on Glance Live as well as on Roposo. This is the Insight Edition, and I'm Priyata Brajbasi. Today, we're going to discuss a very important issue. I think over the last one week, all of us have seen uh, on the news about what Bangalore has been going through, what Bangalore has been uh, witnessing over the last weekend. Bangalore... Uh, received unseasonal heavy rainfall and that led to severe water logging and flooding in many, many parts of Bangalore. Now, of course, Bengaluru or Bangalore is touted as India's Silicon Valley, but shockingly, the entire IT corridor turned into a canal over this week. Uh, the outer ring road in uh, Bengaluru, which essentially connects uh, the city to its main IT parks and IT hubs, several parts of it were severely waterlogged, severely jammed, flooded, and that, of course, caused a lot of hardship to commuters, to travelers who use uh, uh, the outer ring road every single day for commute. Um, what we've heard, uh, or at least what news reports are estimating, is that on Monday, September 5th, when, of course, Bangalore received a very heavy overnight rainfall, at least 2,000 houses were also um, flooded in Bangalore. About 10,000 people had to be rescued from their homes by the state disaster relief uh, force. We're also hearing that they had to, about 20,000 vehicles were also damaged. We saw that uh, the state uh, disaster relief force were rescuing people via boats, via tractors, and even, uh, you know, via bulldozers. So it was a very, very difficult a uh, few days that Bangalore actually witnessed, that Bangalore actually had to go through. Now, what are the reasons uh, why Bangalore faced these severe floods and severe water logging? Now, of course, heavy seasonal, he unseasonal, I'm sorry, unseasonal heavy rainfall, it did lead to encroachment of stormwater drains and also uh, rainfall collection systems were encroached upon because of these rains. But what uh, this flooding has actually f brought focus on is Bangalore's natural topography and how rapid urbanization, how rapid urbanization has affected and what rapid urbanization has actually done to it. What experts believe is that the interconnectivity between Bangalore's uh, lakes has been lost because of rapid urbanization. And that, like I said, many experts believe is the reason why Bangalore is uh, facing these floods. Now, we know that Bangalore has received uh, heavy rainfall this season. In fact, I do have some stats as well. Uh, from June 1st, 2022, the city has received 769 mm of rainfall, which is significantly more than the 425 mm average for this period. But it can't all be blamed on climate change. It can't all be blamed on unseasonal uh, heavy rainfall. There is a lot more that is uh, the reason behind Bangalore, Bangalore having to face this situation. Um, has Bangalore's urban planning been flawed? Has Bangalore's infrastructure development been flawed? Uh, has uh, environment or have environment norms been taken into consideration as Bangalore expands? These are the sorts of questions that we are going to target today. And joining me on the program today is a very special guest, Bhargavi S. Rao. She is a trustee and a senior fellow at the Environment Support Group, which is based in Bangalore. She has about 30 years of experience across research, advocacy and campaigning in uh, urban planning public health, environment, and social justice. Thank you so much, uh, Bhargavi, for taking out time and joining me on the program today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody um, in your team uh, for having me over. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak on this channel, particularly in the context of Bangalore. So thank you. We really yeah. Yeah, I actually yeah. did want to sort of start with Bangalore's uh, natural topography, like I was mentioning in the introduction as well. Uh, we need to understand Bangalore's natural topography, and then we can sort of 
try and focus on what are or on how the natural topography has been encroached upon and that of course has now led to the situation that bangalore is in so if we can start with that sure. uh, if yeah. bangalore with bangalore's topography yeah see for, so first of all bangalore is a city that is on a plateau we are about 1000 meters above sea level and there is no water body close to bangalore the nearest river is about 100 kilometers away which is the kaveri river so civilizations the early civilizations that settled down in bangalore they understood the landscape of bangalore there is a ridge that runs north to south dividing the city into three different valley regions and in each of these valley regions the early settlers also understood the kind of rainfall bangalore gets bangalore gets rainfall from say the last week of may early june until september and then we also get a little rain in december then some showers in um, april actually uh, called the april showers so with uh, so much of rainfall both from the southwest monsoon the northeast monsoon then um, also during the summer because of convection precipitation the early settler understood the area and wherever there was a depression they built a bund around it to collect mm. rainwater so rainwater harvesting was what kick started bangalore very early and that water supplied for domestic use to grow horticulture and agriculture crops uh, for animals for livestock for practically everything and bangalore was a place you won't believe once upon a time they grew apples as well hmm. uh, so being a place like that uh, it brought in a lot of trade in the early years of its uh, growth and that was how the what we call the old bangalore the pete area started because you know they were weavers they were uh, cotton growing people who were trading their product they were people who were uh, selling bangles so it, it, interestingly the old area is named after every product it, that sold on that particular street so there is a mm. pete bale pete cotton pete so on and so forth so but as the city grew post independence uh, there was no um, planning that took place systematically Hmm. Uh, so the early neighborhoods that were planned were uh, the Basangudi and the Maleshwaram, which was planned largely based on the British model, which uh, had taken place in the cantonment area. They copied a lot of the uh, British system of planning, and those areas are, were beautifully planned. From if you look at it from the Google Earth uh, view, hmm. you can see how beautifully uh, roads are designed. They they had wide uh, footpaths. The stormwater drain was after the footpath and not ne necessarily just next to the housing line. Uh, fire hoses, there were tree lined avenues. Hmm. But post 60s, when the Bangalore um, started growing, when the city started growing, that was when uh, madness kicked in. Uh, to a certain extent, Jainagar, which is one of the largest planned neighborhoods, is pretty good. But after Jainagar, everything that came was uh, basically, you know, it kept violating one or the other rules. Hmm. So now Environmental we, norms. Both, hmm. Not just environmental. So uh, there is something called the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, building right. bylaws, all these were being violated. So slowly. even the urban planning laws were being violated. Yes, they mm. were um, being. Uh, and also, what we need to understand is our urban planners are not people who are trained in urban planning. They're mostly civil engineers who know how to pour concrete and uh, stone. And mm. Mm. Uh, so, so what do you result, think are the biggest factors? You know that yeah. Are so I'm just coming to that. Yeah, yeah. Coming to that. So what yeah. has happened over the last? Uh, uh, three, four decades is a systematic uh, disregard to the laws. So we have to mm. look at it from both from a central perspective and the state perspective and the city perspective. So if you look at the um, environmental laws, all apartment complexes uh, were removed from the purview of uh, public hearing Way back in 2005 and six, when the mm. EIA notification uh, came, then mm. amendment came in. 
Then more recently in 2016, they removed another chunk of apartments as long as they were less than 20,000 square kilometers or something like that from the purview of an EIA. And then they also removed a whole lot of uh, buildings from the purview of EC also. Mm. And they made the process of getting EC for those which were very big at the state Mm. level very easy. So at the state level, you have something on the state uh, environment appraisal committee and that committee has a bunch of uh, retired um, bureaucrats who went around clearing every project. Hmm. Why I'm mentioning this is we have attended public hearings of apartments until 2005. Hmm. See, the public hearings play a very important role because it is the local people who know the landscape who Hmm. can point out the challenges when an apartment complex is coming there. So Hmm. once you remove that, there is no public uh, say at all. Bureaucrats Hmm. went about doing what they did. So these are a bunch of problems from an environment impact and environmental law. Then the Town and Country Planning Act of uh, the Karnataka state has a whole lot of guidelines which gives authorities on ideas of how neighborhoods can be planned. But all that has been, you know, buried in under the BBMP perhaps, because the BBMP does have a town and country planning department. Hmm. I really don't know if they even read uh, the provisions. Then the building bylaws have been completely violated. It's so easy to violate building bylaws in the country. A few years back, I think about again, 10 or 15 years back, we had Carlton fire That was the first time people woke up to the fact that building bylaws were uh, being violated because Mm. uh, after the fire happened, it was so difficult to evacuate the people and many people died because they couldn't evacuate them. Yeah. But since then, there has been no stringent measures to ensure laws are followed. So it is not just the lack of following of these laws. There have been so many court orders as well. Even the court, there's complete disregard to the court orders. Hmm. Uh, in fact, our organization has been working on this lake issue systematically since 2008. Hmm. And we've got some very good interim judgments which actually provide uh, um, buffer zones to lakes. But none of those provisions have been uh, followed. There yeah. have been court appointed You know, appointed speaking of committees. lakes, uh, you know, Bhargavi, and very quickly, I do want to say that our, I think our viewers are very, very defensive of uh, Bangalore because we asked them a question about has Bangalore's urban planning been flawed? And 100% of them say no. So I think people <laughs> are being very, very defensive of uh, Bangalore at this point. But yeah, like you, coming back to your point about, uh, you know, the... The, the interconnectivity of Bangalore's lakes. Now, that is, I was sort of going through uh, during the research for the show, I was going through a lot of, you know, what experts were talking about and what they felt were the reasons for uh, this flooding and the loss of interconnectivity between Bangalore's major lakes, the four of the four major lakes, was one of the reasons why they said uh, Bangalore is flood, flooding time and again. Yeah, so like I said, once you violate all the building bylaws, the provisions of the Environment uh, Protection Act, when you remove these projects from the purview of uh, environmental clearance and impact assessments and all that, it becomes easy. Then the next important point is the nexus between the real estate uh, lobby, the bureaucracy and the politicians. Mm. And we also have to understand that the disaster we are facing today is because our cities are being run by parastatals. So the parastatals don't work in coordination with each other. You have a BDA, you have a BWSSB, you have BESCOM, you have BMRDA, BMLTA, so on and so forth. Each of them don't coordinate with each other. And Mm. you cannot hold them accountable because they are beyond any kind of accountability uh, when it comes to planning. And if Mm. you look at the BDA master plans themselves, the master plans have no public involvement in it. It is a consultant sitting across the world in his own comfort zone uh, planning for Bangalore. So this is the reason we have resulted in a city which is uh, flooding. And it is very shameful because for a city that boasts so much of its science and technology, Mm. 
and uh, you know the ITBT companies, we failed in our very basic sciences of understanding the landscape of a city, the ecology of the city, the kind of livelihoods this uh, ecology supported, and we built violating the laws. Hmm. So it, it is a complete failure of, uh, what can I say? I think it, it is arrogance on the part of the city to uh, say that we know how to build. And it is also because, you know, we saw a lot of uh, the Western cities, the hmm. um, coming in, the, uh, the growth of the IT in Bangalore, hmm. saw a lot of the Western uh, concepts of how cities are. And we you know, blindly copied that yeah. on a landscape, on an ecological landscape that was not going to get, that Support was not it. going to withstand yeah. it. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, you know, there was no humility in the um, people who built the city, planned the city, designed the city to yeah. understand uh, the city. So that is where uh, another major chunk of the problem yeah. I lies. also do want to focus on the, you know, the recent construction of Bangalore's IT parks and IT hubs. They were one of the worst affected uh, by these floods. Uh, not just this time. In fact, we have faced uh, or we have been hearing incidents of flooding uh, many times in this year. And one of the worst affected are some of uh, Bangalore's IT parks and IT hubs. So in, in the construction of these uh, parks, IT parks and hubs, what sort of violations do you think uh, we have sort of seen? Yeah, see, so this part of the city, which runs from the northeast to the southeast, engulfed many uh, agrarian and pastoral villages. And when it engulfed those villages, in fact, there was a lot of resistance in the late 90s and the early 2000s when this entire so-called IT corridor proposed. Hmm. Uh, but it still went ahead and uh, it, it, it always was divided from the main city, first of all. Uh, it, it remained completely aloof and uh, that is at one point. Then when the uh, part was built, it failed to provide interconnectedness within Mm. those villages it engulfed. It Mm. only created these high speed um, outer ring road and uh, widened the road that goes to Sarjapur and Whitefield and so on. Mm. So with a lack of interconnected road network with these smaller villages all around, Today, these are the only ways to uh, reach these destinations. Had there been some kind of interconnectedness, one, the traffic mess would not be the way we are seeing. Then yeah. the second main problem is, see, we, the, the one, the IT and the BT companies, they largely wanted uh, to live, work and uh, strike deals in a place which is all very close by. And so these provided the very um, apt gated uh, colonies for them. And these gated colonies uh, also had the spaces where they could drive in easily and park easily. So Mm. they went two floors underground and cemented the whole thing. Mm. So you will not find an inch of uh, soil as a result, there is no space for water to be uh, to percolate in, absorbed by uh, the earth. So yeah. all of that uh, water is standing outside, and it has uh, contributed uh, to the current uh, condition. Yeah. Uh, so th- th- this is where uh, multiple things have gone wrong. Then there is also the infrastructure that came more recently, which does not kind of fit in well with the old village infrastructure that was there perhaps in all these villages where drains were let in and out from everywhere. Mm. Uh, It was only the new neighborhoods where some of the new infrastructure came and these are probably at a higher level than some of the other regions. Uh, So they really did not study the landscape when uh, this entire process was done. And you mentioned about the interconnectedness of the lakes. So nowhere in Bangalore do we have at even two kilometers of the Rajakalwe or the canal system, um, you know, running nicely. Mm. Bangalore is actually a, a city like, you know, Venice or any other city, Amsterdam, where we could have beautiful waterways. If Mm. only we had thought about it 
and imagined uh, properly mm. but this haphazard way of um, building a city and pleasing a certain community of the city right because it was the it and the bt um, sector which was lobbying very hard they wanted to please them to retain mm. them within the state so they just did everything which was more like a quick fix bandage solution rather than plan for the future uh, in making sure that it is an inclusive planning for the city absolutely uh, yeah because very, you know, you're very right in at, pointing that out that just yeah. at, at to the please end a of certain the day, community to please the exactly. it sort of sector that was lobbying very hard we did go really fast and we very rapidly prog- uh, you know pros- progressed with the infrastructure without really putting in the proper uh, planning in place yeah yeah and I lastly, also you know what i want I, to say is yeah. just one more point see at the end of the day th- the rich people have their insurances which will take care of their luxury cars and their villas and all that and they will get on with life i yesterday i read that bangalore's hotels in that region are running for 30000 to 40000 rupees per room per, per night, night. Mm-hmm. they they will get away with it but it is the poor and the vulnerable you know who are at the margins who are all the time picking up scavenging for whatever is left over to rebuild their lives and we will you know never do anything about that because there is no plan to include them to hear their voices when it comes to such planning and Absolutely. that needs to change and the only solution for that is to fix our local governance that means uh, implementing the 73rd and the 74th amendment which is you know the provisions of those two amendments which happened way back in 1992 which decentralized mm. governance so as a result the city has to be planned by the area sabhas where uh, you know they submit their plans to the ward committee the ward committees will co- consolidate the plans and give it to the metropolitan planning committee and that yeah. passes it on to the state commission and then to the state government that has to be the way of planning and not this top down approach yeah in fact i would uh, request our viewers if you have questions regarding uh, the bangalore floods what led to it we are discussing that if you have questions please uh, send them in the comments below please participate in the polls as well i'm going to be putting a few polls up as well so please participate in that uh bhargavi i did want to ask you about um, you know what this unseasonal heavy rainfall actually talks about the city's capability of adapting to climate change now like i said in the beginning as well that this cannot be attributed just to climate change of course it is one of the factors but this this has a lot of man made so it is sort of a man made disaster as well but what does this say about our capability to adapt to climate change it seems that we are just not there yet in fact far from uh, it you yeah yeah you're very right we are far away from it so all the disaster management cells that have been set up in many of our cities are not doing any kind of vulnerability mapping if you can have maps of areas where you know flooding may occur what will happen to those people how is it that we can rescue them if we have systems in place to rescue them at the ward level if we do a ward level assessment of the situation raise awareness amongst the people on how to save themselves and their families and their loved ones and if we can have early warning systems which say today is going to rain don't go out or even if you go out make sure you are you know with a b c and other um, uh, support systems we don't have any of this in a city that talks of science and technology that mm. is such a shame mm mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so unless we have that it's not just bangalore i think these are systems that need to be put across the country uh, particularly you know many of the cities in assam see this many of the cities across the coastal belts see such uh, rainfall the fishing communities suffer so we really have to gear up uh, towards yeah. building systems to solve that and technology alone is not going to solve the problem you have hmm. to hear people's voices involve them include them in the process only when there is ownership of whatever solution we are providing by the local people uh only then those solutions will work a uh, very tech savvy approach from top down is not going to you know lead us anywhere yeah. yeah what can what are the lessons that 
the government can take from uh, this particular incident, this particular incident of flooding and waterlogging in several parts of Bangalore? What are the oh, lessons? <laughs> there have been many, you know, the pandemic taught us so many lessons, but we are going on with business as usual. Many of the fires in the city have shown us. Um, issues of garbage have uh, taught us many lessons, but still we don't seem to take it up from there. That is also because, you know, Bangalore today does not have an um, elected mayor. Yeah. We don't have and I think the people also agree years. with you because 100% of people are saying that Bangalore is not ready to adapt to climate change yet. Yeah, so I think people should uh, be on the streets and demand that uh, measures of local governance be fixed because today it is flood, tomorrow it could be air pollution related problem, day after it could be something else. So yeah. unless we fix things at the ward level, uh, we will not have any systems in place. So I think the only way is for people to be out on the streets and demand these things be fixed for their uh, safety and livability of the city. Absolutely, because you know, even on Twitter, when this was this entire um, this entire incident was occurring in Bangalore, even on Twitter, you know, a lot of people were saying, and that this hashtag of Leave Bangalore was trending. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was actually one of the things that I tweeted was that, you know, it is not about leaving the city. This disaster is not indicative that it's time for you to leave the city, but it is actually what it what needs to happen is that people now need to start seeking accountability from their uh, local bodies, from their uh, from their government, from the people that they've elected, their MLAs, their MPs. You need to seek accountability. And just yes. leaving the city is not the way that this something like this can be fixed. Yeah, and also it's not that any other city has systems in place. Across the yeah. country, it is the same problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, speaking yeah. of other cities, what sort of lessons do you think maybe a Bombay or Mumbai, you know, could teach Bangalore? Because Mumbai has been going through this year in and year out. Do you think there are lessons, if any? Uh, perhaps... Little, little things, uh, because there also it is about, you know, we always talk about Mumbai being very resilient. Why should anybody be resilient? That's, yeah. you know, why can't the state and the city give me a safe space to live in, a safe space to move around, safe ways to be mobile? It is not or maybe about, other case studies, I, maybe not in India, maybe yeah, case so, studies So Yeah, elsewhere. I think yeah. so the... So the uh, lessons that we need to learn is, again, largely from other cities which have handled these kind of situations. And it's, you know, it's all written down in law. It's not that we don't have it. We don't really have to ape the West. While we have aped the West in creating these expressways, which are basically fast moving, uh, speedy uh, uh, rides for the luxury cars, uh, we have not put simple systems in place like waste segregation mm. right and waste segregation does not require uh, high tech knowledge for that it's not no rocket building technology it's about segregating composting recycling consuming less at the end of the day creating less waste mm. so there are solutions in and around us there are solutions amongst us and there is no one solution that fits all yeah. so what might work for uh, 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 Sarjapur may not work for Marathali and what may work for Marathali will not work for, you know, some Hebal area. So I think locally people have to come together, see, read the law, read the provisions of the various guidelines we have. We have so many guidelines. You know, we have court appointed committees that have given excellent recommendations when it comes to lakes. We have court appointed committees that have given excellent recommendations uh, on buildings and safety and so on. Hmm. Why is it that those uh, reports are not read? Why is it that those reports are not discussed about? Why is it that we are not aware of it? I yeah. think we have a very uphill task of learning and understanding about all this and fixing uh, problems with the local government. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think we should go... What would, uh, you, what would you suggest in the end? Just some first immediate steps that need to be taken right after this. 
uh, I, I think everybody should read the uh, provisions in the 11th schedule of the 73rd amendment and the 12th schedule of the 74th amendment because all of that are functions of the local government. If I know that my local government, my ward committee is responsible to fix the drain in, near my house, the waste near my house, um, my mobility, my burial ground, my public health related issues, my livelihood, then I will wake up and get that rolling. Today we mm. all think that one more authority, one more parastatal will fix our problem. We have enough and more parastatals who have destroyed our city and I think that needs to end. Yeah. I think uh, with that, uh, we have come to the end of this show. Thank you so much, uh, Bhargavi, for taking our time and joining me on this program today. I think um, lots of lessons to be learned from this uh, incident that Bangalore has witnessed. I know things are much better in the city right now. Hopefully, things continue to get better. And yeah, as people, I think we do need to seek accountability from our government, from our, government, from our local government, from our MLAs, from our MPs. And this, I think it will all it'll, it'll happen when we are very strict about that and we do seek accountability. And even for our government, I think we need to be very, very mindful about what we do uh, further when it comes to urbanization in Bangalore. And I think we really need to take a lot of things into consideration, including uh, the environment, including the topography, the hydrology of the area. Uh, before we make decisions about rapid urbanization. Yeah, very, very true. And uh, I think we need to engage a lot more, be out, uh, try and understand, be out of our comfort zones and also reach out to those people who are suffering today uh, and uh, help them in ways yeah. in which we can fix, uh, you know, what they are going through. Yeah, and you were very that. right in pointing out that it is the poor that are the most vulnerable to incidents like this, even to climate change, you know. The rich will be able exactly. to somehow adapt, yeah. but you know, they, the poor. Their yeah. debt will only go up because now another big threat with all the flooding is, uh, if we all remember what happened in Surat many, many years ago, how plague broke down, you know, there was an um, incident of plague, then again in Mumbai. Uh, when newer um, infections are coming up, those are things we need to be worried about. And we, we need to have another round of, uh, you know, um, assessment of how yeah. well our public health systems can next attend to the epidemic that might uh, emerge in Bangalore. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you once again, uh, Bhargavi, Thank for taking you. our time and joining me on the Insight Edition on the Glance Live platform. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed speaking too. Bye -bye. Me too. Thank you to all of our viewers who took our time and uh, watched our program. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel as well, youtube.com slash C slash Priyata Brajbasi. Please also follow me on my social media handles. I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook and Twitter. And you can reach out to me if you have suggestions about the topics that we should cover on the Insight Edition. Thank you so much to all of our viewers for watching. Have a great weekend. You'll find me once again on Monday with another big topic of the week. Thanks again.